Lime Books present Overpopulation by Robert Salisbury. Episode 1 Water Scarcity. Scene 1 Pradesh, India. Mama, Mama! Barefooted Rupal ran towards his home. More shack than brick house, it sat on seven acres of dusty flat land. His family had farmed there for generations. His mother dried her hands on a towel and walked to the dirt entrance of their home. Mama, it's dry! His mother stared into the distance, where her husband and the expensive engineer from the city were drilling. Their latest borehole had been their deepest yet. Do not do! It is your life savings! Her father had warned. He thought everything was expensive. Only this time he was right. There were mouths to feed, and their only other option was so bad. During her childhood, they would dig down a few feet and find water. The land was waterlogged and plentiful. But over successive years, they had had to drill deeper and deeper. This latest attempt was their most expensive yet, an investment, a gamble. The drilling company from Nagur had bits that could drill down 90 meters. They were expensive. But what choice did they have? Water meant life. They were gambling with their life savings. Without water, they could grow no crops. Without crops, they would have no income. As she looked at the orange burnished sky, filtered with dust blown up from the parched, desiccated land, the land that stretched to the distance, a patchwork of ancestral memories, a living embodiment of her history, her heart cracked. It's not there. There was only one choice remaining, to go to the city and live in the slums, without land, without space to fight amongst others, amongst millions of rootless poor. Rupal had listened to his parents fretting over this outcome for months. He knew only fear. What will we do, Mama? His mother looked down into his big, innocent brown eyes that pleaded for resolution. He believed in her omnificence. Where has the water gone? She pulled him to her hip. Her father was right. There was no hope. Scene 2. Beggar on the Freeway. Delhi. The sun had not done with Delhi. It intended to burn everything and everyone. To incinerate, to kill to create thermals that would carry debris and detrius high above the city, burling and twirling, and colliding with soot from nine million exhaust pipes, dusting the streets in poisonous silt, and lining the lungs of a million urchins who lived on the street. Entering this scene was Philip Banks, a debonair 40-year-old English banker, whose objective was to secure a multi-billion dollar water infrastructure project. Why? Because it is liquid gold. He worked for Delange Martin, a private bank at which he had been for over a decade. He left his hotel and instantly felt the heat through his jacket. His milky white Lexus awaited. Still in the secure grounds of his hotel, his driver stood next to the open door, in hat, gloves, and an immaculate black suit. Beneath this veneer of civility, Delhi belched out a cacophony of automotive indigestion. He thanked his driver and settled into the coconut leather of his rear seat. With the door shut and the bedlam of the city sealed out, he was in meditative paradise. Even his seat was temperature controlled. Such excesses were a prerequisite for maintaining balance amidst such claustrophobia. He removed his shades and opened the document he had been working on, a contract 
for access to the DFL Mall of India on behalf of H2 Envirocon, the British construction company he represented. It was owned by his employer, Delange Martin. He was leading a tender for the Delhi Basin Water Infrastructure Project, a $38 billion plan to supply water and waste treatment to the 32 million people who lived in the metropolis. His main problem was access to land and property owned by DFL Construction, the Indian competitor for the project, who, by terrible coincidence, happened to own the DFL Mall of India, a vast shopping complex under which infrastructure would need to pass. Without access to the DFL Mall of India, pipe work would have to be diverted miles, burdening their budget and making their tender uncompetitive. He was under orders to secure the project, no questions asked, even if it meant going outside the law. The prospect was unpalatable, but in view of the fact that a team of thousands had worked on the tender for three years, failure was unthinkable. His team in London had sent amendments to their tender for his approval. As head of project, Banks had sign-off. He was, without any belief of success, about to raise his offer to DFL for access to the Mall of India. Banks had overseen 18 such water projects for megacities, with a population exceeding 20 million, over the past five years mainly in countries that had experienced a population explosion since the 1970s. So, predominantly China, Southeast Asia, South America, Africa and India. Ten minutes into the cross-city journey, they hit traffic. Sorry, sorry, sir. This traffic very bad. His driver seldom spoke. But they stopped again in the centre of four lanes. Cars were stationary in both directions. Delhi's traffic system was abysmal. Over the past four days, Banks had spent more than three hours each day stuck in traffic. His mind span like the wheels on a fruit machine, selecting the options for action he might need to take should DFL refuse his offer. Even if successful, he would need to break lease on hundreds of retail, commercial and residential tenancies in order to reconstruct the shopping mall. It was a nightmare. Local government was fully behind his competitor, DFL. Any attempt to win the contract from DFL would mean oiling the wheels of local government, further stretching his already bloated budget. He closed his pad and stretched out his legs. Despite being a constant 22 degrees inside the car, the glass was hot to touch. The midday temperature had hit 44 Celsius. Outside, the road surface was blistering hot and an almighty grey cloud was forming from the automobiles tailgating into the distance, each belching out exhaust in their attempt to maintain the air conditioning. A man appeared at Banks's passenger side window a very thin man in a much-stained cream sash and clutching a piece of red cloth covetously. He smiled, revealing toothless gums. Although not threatened by the man, Banks did feel a need to understand him. How old was he? Was he forty or eighty? He could not decide. The severity of his poverty was an abstraction that Banks found hard to see beyond. What kind of a man is he? Sorry, sir, I will tell him to move along. No need. The beggar bobbed his head in the affirmative, whilst holding the red cloth to the window. Does he expect me to understand? Banks thought him wretched, but his mind was also occupied with considerations of by how much he would need to bribe local government in order to turf out thousands of people from their lease on property. The beggar's eyebrows seemed to suggest that he understood that too. It was hard for Banks not to pity him, standing beneath the midday sun, on a road that would radiate as much heat as the lining of a tandoor oven. 
Descending from the embankment, along the hard shoulder, came a ragged army of waif strays and beggars, offering everything from tacky plastic kitchenware to homemade candy on a stick. Are there no jobs for these people? Oh, sir, they are so lazy. Good for nothing peoples. Don't take pity on them. They do not go to school. They are not learn to read and write. They are the poor, the Dalit, sir. It is not their fault. Traffic was at a standstill in both directions. Minute by minute, more and more beggars descended onto the road. Soon, each car had a beggar accosting them with pleas to purchase goods, goods that neither driver nor passenger had use for. How much longer? Sir, it can take like this for an hour sometimes, sir. Banks groaned. He had people waiting. The beggar began tapping softly against his window. He appeared to be reciting something. A chant. Sorry, sir, I would chase him away, but I cannot leave the car, sir. Not to worry, Jagdish. You can call me Jason, sir. Jason. Yes, please. I have been called Jason for so many years now. I am not believing that my name is not Jason anymore. The beggar was now pointing down at his left leg, which was missing below the knee. Banks wondered if he would go away if he were handed some money. There was a clunk. Suspecting his passenger might be thinking of opening a window, Jason had applied precautionary central locking. For your safety, sir. sir. He is a Dalit you cannot touch. I see. The beggars were becoming restless from lack of sales. In retaliation, drivers were sounding their horns. Banks became uneasy at the thought of what they might do in such heat were their pleas not met with sympathy. My family is from Kashhatrias. We were once glorious rulers. Oh, yes, sir. The balance of allegiance shifted from Indians together against the English to Jason and himself against the beggar, who was still tapping a kind of Morse code against the window. He has nothing to lose, thought Banks. The driver took the moment to share his opinion. I do not like Dalit. Banks looked at the Dalit once more and found that to his astonishment, he recognized the words being muttered. An English rhyme. ring a ring roses a pocket full of posies. A tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. Up ahead, the traffic had begun to move. The Dalit smiled back at Banks, without reproach or condemnation. As the Lexus pulled away, the beggar's red scarf appeared to unravel as though it were caught in the door. Banks turned and witnessed the old man fall into the road behind them. No sooner had he fallen than the car behind them ran over him and carried on driving without slowing or changing course. Stop! Stop! Stop the car! Banks leapt up to the rear window, hoping to see something encouraging about the beggar, who had now become lost under a second and a third car. Can't stop, sir! Too much traffic! Stop, I said! Banks yanked and shoved at his door, but it was locked. Sorry, sir, cannot stop here. Nobody stop for Dalit. Banks stared back, desperate for a sign that the old man had survived. But he never appeared. As they picked up speed, all that could be seen was the blank expression on the face of beggars they passed and the distant flap of the beggar's cream sash on the road. Traffic in both directions soon reached maximum speed and Banks slumped into his seat. He felt winded, defeated, and turned his gaze to the forest of skyscrapers that comprised Delhi's financial district. What kind of progress has this country made? Air conditioner works so much better now, sir. You can relax. Scene 3 Thakula Construction, New Delhi. Banks was late for his appointment, and it did not seem to faze anyone. He was greeted by Thakula Construction CEO Rajya P. Thakula, a tall, gangly Gen Y in a badly tailored blue silk suit. 
It did nothing to disguise his pot belly and narrow hips. He wore his hair slicked back with gel, which created an undignified shine to his black hair. They shook hands. Radja's grip was weak and slightly damp. In view of the fact that the cooler was a construction company, it told Banks that Radja was most likely the son of the owner. I would like to introduce you to our chief engineer, Anjali Mittal. Banks shook hands with Mittal. He will be joining us on this morning's inspection. Mittal was a more plausible character, with big round eyes, surrounded by black dusting, pudgy cheeks and a neatly trained beard that twisted to a knot beneath his chin. He moved in his suit as if he were made from dough. They were two of the most unlikely characters to be running a construction company. Having taken the lift to the top of their building and made the roof, they were soon climbing into the waiting helicopter. They flew over Delhi. From above, Banks observed that the city was an endless maze of narrow streets between tightly knitted housing sprinkled with sand. Breaking up this were sporadic clusters of modern high-rise and, gently cutting curves across it all, were modern highways that seemed to respect no historic boundaries. Beyond the city limits, the land was a patchwork of green squares of differing shade, which soon petered out to a barren, sandy-coloured landscape. Along the way, and over the noise of the engine and rotor blades, Anjali maintained a commentary. This is important agri-land. All water from these fields is being diverted from Yamuna River. But that is problem. Yamuna River is main feed for Delhi, no longer sufficient. Our nearest alternative is Ganges, but that is also a problem. He explained that India's population was still growing and that the middle and affluent upper classes were using more water than ever, not to mention producing more effluent. They had built long-distant pipes across hundreds of miles, but were unable to meet demand. Having arrived at their destination, they entered an industrial lift that descended underground. They emerged into a concrete tunnel lit by a single line of yellow lamps that stretched towards a white pinpoint. We connect to Ganges in that direction and this direction to Delhi. You could drive a double-decker bus through here. Why so large? Banks looked at his shoes. There was a trickle of water, but not enough to worry his socks. It used to be full, confirmed Mittal. As it crosses the plateau, we need to recycle, as in UK. Did you know that by the time the Thames has reached London, water has passed through seven people? Banks smiled, appreciating the lengths to which they were going to prove what was already known. Anjali smiled. He certainly enjoyed his job. But tell me, Mr. Banks... One thing about your project. Your capacity is very low. We run the numbers and, excuse me for saying, but for Delhi, I understand. It seems like our capacity is low. But with technology, we will need greater capacity, not less. Delhi is still growing. It could shrink. I don't think so. For your tender to work, demand would have to fall. Why is that? It's complicated. Banks left it at that. That night, Banks attended a banquet in his honour. It was hosted by Raja P. Thakula and his father, Thakula Sr., who had allowed his son to prepare Banks for their meeting. The following day, Banks was keen to get down to business. He was offering Thakula Construction major contracts to supply teams of construction workers. The scale of works would require thousands of labourers 
and skilled workers, which needed to be sourced and managed locally. Senior engineers would be brought in by H2 Enviracon and report to their head office in Basingstoke, UK. What banks wanted from Thakula in return for the contract was government influence. For without access to the Ganges, to Delhi Pipeline and the DFL Mall of India, nothing would be achieved. I will award the contract to you if you can get me political influence. A politician. Anjali and Raja looked at one another. Then, full of smiles, Raja replied, No problem. Verin da Kirmani is my cousin. Scene 4, Rashtrapati Vavan, New Delhi. The following day, Bank sat in the back of his Lexus, heading along the Grand Boulevard of Rajpath to the former home of the British Viceroy of India, the Rajtrapati Pavan. Built in 1929, the Grand Palace was now the official residence of Rajya's cousin, the Prime Minister of India, Ferinda Kirmani. After some ceremonial etiquette and a brief tour of the more elaborate rooms of the palace, Banks was taken to a cinema room where he sat alone in a comfortable seat in front of a white screen. Joining him a few minutes later was Prime Minister Verinda Kirmani. They greeted one another with shook hands, then sat side by side in silence as the lights dimmed. Are we are going to be 36 million years? Three times bigger than your London. Oh, it is very peely little city now, compared to international stage. In the New World, where a country like India and China, Indonesia, Nigeria, we are much, much bigger than you. And now I see Paris only two and a half million. London only six million. Very small country now. Uh, don't be so angry if you are not part of the new world, if you are part of history. Are we a old culture? And sometimes you white people used to be powerful for a short space, just a little space. Our history go back a long time, 3,000 years. And you only to 1066, only such short time. It is time for you to retire from international world, because London now only 6 million people. I think you will find that greater London... Oh, why is it you are making your numbers less and less? I notice Paris now only 2.5 million. Uh, but I was there recently, and I think it is bigger than ever. Most international cities, you see, they are growing. Urbanization is the modern movement. And of course, Calcutta is now 25 million, and Bagrahan is now 30 million. And we in Delhi, we are going for 36 million. Does your population cause any problems? We do have two problems. One is water, which I am confident that with your help we can resolve. The other is more pressing. Banks had been briefed on the Prime Minister's diminishing support and the prospect of a second term in office. With the forthcoming national election, overhauling the city water supply would go down well with the electorate, especially since water had become such a pivotal topic, but not if it were assigned to a British firm in preference to a local Indian one. Still, Banks was there to pitch for Delange Martin, for Britain, which were practically interchangeable terms. Our tender will save two years in construction and come in under DFL saving you time and money. But your tender is to build very small capacity, 
not like very big Indian proposal as DFL bid. Our modeling suggests that Delhi's population will have shrunk by then. What are you talking about? Delhi very big city, not a dearly piddly small city like London or Paris. No, I think you tend to have problem. The Prime Minister dismissed this hypothesis, then drew attention to something else. I be showing you something. Footage ran on the screen, showing thousands and thousands of people holding banners, chanting and beating drums, whilst occupying Old Delhi's main square. That was last month. Another city was shown, with similar crowds. A sea of red. Banks thought of the beggar from the day before, clutching at his piece of red cloth. They are my problem. This is week 11, and their numbers are growing, not shrinking. So you see, not only our city is big, but our problems big too. Banks was surprised at the size of the protests, which had not registered in his debriefing. He would have words with the research on his return to London. Who are they and what do they want? They are red band. What they want is revolution. Banks stared at the masses and wondered how many there were. The shot changed to another city and more crowds. To date, they are in Rajasthan. But already receiving a report, they spread to Uttar Pradesh and Gujarat. Verinda turned to face Banks. If you resolve my problem, I resolve yours. You have been listening to Overpopulation, the hidden agenda for global reset. Book three in the Philip Banks trilogy by... Robert Salisbury.